in, in terms of the military doctrines that it, that it has, it does and it has in the past preemptively attacked nuclear reactors in the Middle East, the, the case in point being the Oz Iraq, Iraq in Iraq in 1981, preemptively over a concern at that time that Saddam Hussein was um, possibly um, developing that reactor with a view to actually um, developing a nuclear weapons program. Mm. And I think that's one background concern that the Americans may have. But the more immediate concern is if you do attack um, nuclear facilities in Iran, of which there are several, including research centers, including centers where they are enriching uranium that are actually being inspected by the IAEA on a regular basis. So those in inspections are ongoing. Um, those UN inspections have been ongoing and have never stopped. But also a nuclear power reactor in the south that's been operational since, I think, around the late 1970s. Um, by targeting those and striking those, that, that just would just be a you know, a, a massive escalation in the view of the Iranians. It's not just a direct attack on the country, but obviously there's a massive um, danger in terms of what it means for the, um, the, the, the spread of radioactive material, mm -hmm. fissile material mm -hmm. that they've been um, uh, producing in some of those centers. Um, and obviously the, the factor of the loss of civilian life, but I think in this case, that's less of a concern than just f f symbolically what what this would what this would mean and the reaction it would then trigger um, in response from the Iranians. So these sort of multifaceted risks or consequences that can be imagined. Yeah. President Pazeshkian of Iran has been in Doha and according to state media saying that Iran wants peace and security. How much credibility does that hold? How much scope might there be for peace talks, maybe even involving uh, Qatar as an intermediary? Well, I think, I think um, that's a very good question and I think this um, trip to Doha is very interesting. It was scheduled in advance, so he was meant to be going from a a while back because there's um, an Asian uh, conference for dialogue. Some, there's a there's a regional conference going there going on there right now, so he was meant to be going, um, but it's a, it's it's not a huge deal that conference. So he could have very easily, maybe under other circumstances, not turned up um, because it's a foreign ministerial conference as well. But by going um, yesterday, it also suggests that he's he's very likely to want to talk about um, security in the region and the um, escalations with Israel and this concern about there being obviously a full scale war in the region. And we know that Doha has played a pivotal role um, over the past uh, best part of a decade now in mediating dialogue not just between Iran and the US but more recently between Hamas and Israel over Israel's bombardment in Gaza and trying to secure a ceasefire there. So I think I would be very surprised if Pezeshkian did not arrive in Doha with some thoughts and ideas over how they can de-escalate in the region. It really depends now on whether the Israelis are um, amenable to anything like that or whether they've made a very it sounds like they have made a very um, decisive choice to um, retaliate um, it's just we have to look at what the parameters of, the re of that retaliation are, are likely to look like and I suppose what sort of effect could that have in Iran if we're thinking about public opinion, public support, both for, for those who are in power, but also these other groups like Hezbollah and Hamas that are supported by Iran? I think that's a very good question. I think one of the challenges and the dilemmas that that is facing the Islamic Republic and specifically the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei is the fact that they are they are not a popular system at the moment. Um, they have faced incredibly high levels of dissent and um, internal opposition and unpopularity and we've seen that from the election figures. They've had over the past three, three popular elections in the country have all hit record lows in terms of participation, not to mention the uprising we had in 2022, which was some of the most violent and uh, kind of uh, deadly um, oppositional violence since the 1979 revolution. So you can't wage a war or escalate a conflict when you are not when you when you can't appeal to your own popularity internally at at home, 
Um, on the other front, um, in terms of in the region, there has been, we, we had a story yesterday on the file with my um, m myself and my colleague Sam Dagher in Dubai um, about the perception on the Arab streets, specifically in countries like uh, Lebanon, of how Iran has so far responded to Israel. And there was a, it was a bit of a mixed bag. There was a lot of celebration in some parts of Beirut um, over Iran's uh, strike. Um, the other day, but at the same time, I think there's a sense of, is that it? Is that all you have to, is that all you have to show? Is that all you have to, you know, um, offer us in terms of, you know, spending the last um, three to four decades kind of um, threatening, threatening Israel, um, painting themselves as the defenders of the Palestinian people of the of the Palestinian cause, and um, when it came down to it, push come, push when push came to shove, a lot of Lebanese were asking, according to our reporting in that story, where were the Iranians? Mm. Why didn't they retaliate more strongly? So it's been mm. a bit of a mixed bag. And I don't, I don't think that you can confidently go into a wider conflict knowing that you don't have enough popular grassroots support on your side. Yeah, and as you say, I mean, three or four decades, you know, it, it has been a complete rethink, actually, of where the power, strength and the balance yeah. of the countries in, in the Middle East actually is in yeah. the last few weeks, which is, I think, quite a lot for specialists like you maybe to be absorbing. What are you thinking about next in terms of the impact? You know, is it this, we're watching out now for what Israel does in response, what is happening on the ground in Lebanon, what else are you thinking about in this dangerous theatre? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, I think about these questions about the, the, the general, to put it in a very basic, simple term, order of things in the Middle East, but more broadly in the world. And for someone, because I've covered Iran for so long, and I think if you're a if you're a journalist with a beat, you, you do tend to suffer from a sort of myopia. You tend to look at things through the lens of that, con of that country. But I do think Iran has had this role for the past 50 years now, almost, of being this, this kind of quite formidable um, bulwark against US, Western, loosely put kind of NATO aligned interests in the Middle East and of course Israeli interests and I think now we're kind of seeing this it's almost like this battle that Khamenei has been waging on a cold front in a shadow war and the Israelis have as well mm. it's now manifesting in 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 the in these really violent violent terms and it's it's very worrying it's it's deep it's deeply worrying but it's also you know you, you kind of you, you kind of if you take the long view i think in some ways we have very slowly walked into this situation if we go back to um maybe the 2015 nuclear deal how it was negotiated, who was negotiating it, who was excluded, who was included, um, the way that nuclear, um, the way that rhetoric on the Western side and um, action and sanctions on the Western and the European side was handled over Iran's nuclear program going back to 2003. Even if you go back to things like George W. Bush's axis of evil speech back in 2002, which happened at exactly the time when Iran was um, starting a very tentative back channel dip, uh, effort with the Americans to try and in a coordinated way defeat the Taliban together in Afghanistan. These kind of opportunities that were dashed and you kind of look, if you take the broad view and you come all the way up to 2019 and Donald Trump and the maximum pressure strat strategy assassinating Qasem Soleimani, all this kind of stuff, it all kind of leads to, to this war scenario that, we've, that we're now faced with in We've some been ways. asking the question all morning is, is, is Israel listening to anything the United States has to say? Who could Iran listen to if there were to try and be diplomatic overtures to try and de-escalate this? Is it the people that you're talking about who are unhappy with the, the regime in Iran? Are there international partners like Russia or China that could exert pressure on Iran now? I think with the first point about Israel, we have to look at, at just the past year. Clearly, Israel 
Israel has not has not really paid much heed to what the United States has said at all. And in fact, another thing that Pezeshkian said yesterday in Doha that was quite interesting, he made a statement where he said, uh, we want peace and uh, security. The America, we, we got a phone call from the Americans and the Europeans telling us after the Haniye, uh, the assassination of the Hamas political leader is Ismail Haniye in Tehran, telling us don't escalate don't respond and we will get a peace uh, we'll get peace in Gaza within a week so that the suggestion is that there was a a quid pro quo there mm. a ceasefire in exchange for you not escalating he said that never materialized so that's another sign that um, Benjamin Netanyahu is going on his own course and he's put his earmuffs on and he doesn't really you know he, he's determined to do whatever it is he needs to do I think there is Obviously, also a strong suggestion that he wants to stay. There's a domestic angle to this where he wants to stay in power for, for as long as he can and maintain his government coalition with the more far right mm. parties um, in Israel. On the point about Iran and um, who can talk to Iran, I think, again, the Doha trip yesterday and Pezeshkian's statements show that. Iran, I think, quite reluctantly um, conducted that missile strike uh, the other night. Um, and I think it felt it really had no choice because of th this perception of its loss of credibility, the perception of weakness was something that I don't think, given the amount of domestic unpopularity it's also facing, it, I don't think it could have... It, it, from its own point of view, it could have it, it could have completely sat down and sat on its on its hands. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of Iran um, not escalating any further, I don't think it will do anything for now. I mean, there's a there's a chance that, and there is there is some suggestion. We had um, a mysterious explosion near the Israeli embassy in Copenhagen around the same time of the strikes. And there is a suggestion that they might take some of this um, retaliation operation offshore to um, other parts of the world where they will try to hit diplomatic, diplomatic Israeli assets. Um, but that's, again, something that's, that has precedent that they've done in the past. Mm.